Greetings Brothers, today we're talking about the best way to build your Blood Angels army to play to our strengths, so let's get into it. If we're just meeting, I'm John, the Blood Angels Commander. Thank you for being here, and I do Blood Angels related posts every week. So if you are interested in seeing that, or live battle reports featuring the Blood Angels, then please consider subscribing. So a few things have changed since Nephilim, so let's talk about building to the Blood Angel's strengths. Now this is one of the lists that I ran recently, and I took this to GT and finished 3rd of 16th. And I think my list has evolved a bit, obviously, since Nephilim and the changes to secondaries on Armour of Contempt. But I think the principles have remained pretty similar. And the strength of a Blood Angel's list, if you're not familiar, and you should be at this point, is we're very fast moving, and we're very heavy hitting in melee. Now, this is probably changed into that like Sangry Guard Swords and arguably Power Swords and Death Company are probably our hardest hitting in terms of raw AP now. Now, people have already made a significant shift to Swords on the Sangry Guard. Some people in last week's video talked heavily about how Death Company with Swords actually do a ton of damage. What I like to do personally is we back up our list with a bit of fire support, but there's definitely been a shift so some Blood Angels players are just going full into the melee. So you'd be talking like three squads of Sangry Guard, multiple squads of Death Company, maybe even some Terminators, and just losing any sort of fire support. So that's an option as well, and that's what we've been seeing. However, we haven't seen anyone win a tournament with that. We've seen some very, very high placings, but we haven't seen any tournament wins. When we did last see some Blood Angels winning tournaments, they tend to be followed up with some fire support, be it eliminators be it eradicators sometimes land speeder storms with scouts and stuff like that so it's important to note as well that even though armor of contempt has provided us with more durability we're still not that survivable we still lack in vulnerable saves you know if you look at this list that i recently played because i played up against andrew and he was like so excited he's like i've got an ability that will turn off your invulnerable saves and i was like well i only have one squad and one guy. You know, 90% of my list has no invulnerable saves. So that's very much how we are now. So there are certain units that we're still very, very weak into. And one of the ones that I recently came up against was the support weapons from the Eldar, which are obviously strength 12, minus four. So these are gonna be wounding on twos and then very quickly that minus four makes things, like makes any sort of saving throws very, very scary. Even Sangry Guard can tend to drop very, very quickly against that. Also, Retributors for Sisters of Battle, ignoring cover. So they're multi melters again, minus four. You're typically losing a lot of Sangry Guard into Retributors, especially when they get like full rerolls from Morgan Val, both to hits and wounds. So although we are fast, we aren't really that durable. Armor Contempt has helped, but we still have to use Obscuring Terrain like every chance we can get. Now, I want to talk about Obsec first, and I think that Obsec is more important than it's ever been. We've got multiple enemy armies now that provide like tons of obsec, knights being an obvious candidate, necrons already were, and there's other rules as well where like essentially like sisters can get double obsec on certain models through through use of relics and stuff like that. So I think obsec is gonna be very important and I've been running battalion for like a year now. Uh, I like both the CP that you start with and it gives you it forces you to take those three troop choices, which gives you three obsec units. Most Blood Angels players in the last year have been looking at double incursors, and then the final squad could go to intercessors, infiltrators, or even uh, assault intercessors. And I think all three choices have merit. And yeah, we're going to get uh, Chris Chance on the channel next week to talk about his recent run to um, like in a in a super major where he finished in the top thirty. He did really well playing Blood Angels, and it's one of the best results we've seen for a little while. So we're going to get that on the channel next week, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. But one of the things that I noticed in his list, and I will be asking all the questions so you guys can definitely learn, um, was the ability to add obsec or remove obsec. And there's two ways we can do this, and I've done a video on this before, but Rites of War and the Visage of Death. Now, when we talked about them before, I don't think they were must-includes. Now I think you need to include one of them. And I think if you're only going to include one of them, Rites of War is the better of the two picks. But it's interesting to see some people would put both these uh, Relic and the Warlord trait on one character, 
Chris, in this instance, put it on two separate characters. So this gives you two ways of potentially flipping objectives. And sometimes flipping those objectives is literally the difference between a win and a loss. So it's super important. So I think you need multiple opposite units. I think you definitely need Rites of War, Visage of Death. I think it's a high tier pick. You just have to be able to work it into your list. Now, the reason I think Visage of Death is the lower of the two picks is it provides a very small amount of survivability, but I don't really rate minus one to hit in melee as a great survivable um, ability in general. Sangry Guard of minus one to hit in melee, and quite often I lose the whole squad in melee. It happens, you know, anytime you play Sisters of Battle, Retributors, Zephyrim, they just kill the whole squad anyway, even with minus one to hit, right? So I don't really rate minus one to hit on a character in melee. It's average at best. What this does though is it makes enemy models within three inches lose obsec. So you could put this on a jump unit, you could advance them, uh, you could fly, you know, probably uh, like average probably like 15 to 18 inches, and then if you end within three of an enemy, you're removing their obsec. Now if you put Rites of War on the same character, you're obviously instantly flipping one objective because that character is obsec and he's removing obsec. However, if you can use Visions of Death to, you know, a charge or advance into position where you're removing obsec and then you can you can flood that objective with some sangry guard or you can get some models on there and kill that that can flip one objective meanwhile rights of war on a different character core a character within six of the warlord have obsec uh, and i've been using this for three to six months now i think the two characters that synergize well with rights of war is the sangry ancient or the sangry priest uh, the ancient maybe even is slightly more powerful because he can do a six inch heroic intervention with the stratagem because he does actually have a sangry guard keyword. The cool thing about this is it's essentially going to daisy chain six inches from your character so your character can be hidden and or your character can be the obsec unit. So if near the end of the game you just want to jump your character onto an objective and just flip it because you are the one obsec unit on it, then that can be pretty valuable as well. I think that once you get deep into the game, the Sangry Priest and or Ancient, they don't provide that much value. They provide value at the start of the game, the Priest, you know, for healing and obviously Assault Doctrine. The Ancient provides value at the start of the game for the additional movement and the plus one to attacks. But near the end of the game, these are just like 100 point characters. They don't have a ton of damage. Uh, they don't have a ton of survivability either. So if you just wanted to jump one on, flip an objective, you know, maybe get an eight point swing or something like that, it's fairly good. The cool thing about this is obviously six inches is going to cover the entire objective marker if you place him correctly. The, re the problem with Visit of Death is three inches isn't going to cover the entire objective marker. Even if you were stood right in the middle on top of the objective, they could probably get like a par model partial within three inches and still take it away from OPSEC. So for me, Visage of Death is more about like, you can use it in your turn to deny the opponent's scoring at the start of their turn, which arguably you can do with Rites of War, but Rites of War you can actually start off the objective with a view to like, maybe you can heroically intervene onto the objective, or you can start off the objective and daisy chain to a core unit within six inches obsec. So both of these are really good. Um, if you're not using either, I highly recommend you start thinking about Rites of War and the two characters. If you watch any of my battle reports, I usually always have these characters, or one of them, running Rites of War. Now, let's continue about how we continue to make a strong list. So, once we've picked that battalion, we're going to get six elite slots. And elite slots in Blood Angel's army, and picking the right elites at the moment can be pretty difficult. I'd say commonly we're seeing three squads of Sangry Guard at size of six and sevens. People always ask why you run Sangry Guards as six or sevens. I think fives, four or fives are going to bounce off enemy units, sixes or sevens with a little bit of help from like chapter master rerolls or being within range of the warlord or quake bolts or something, they're going to do a ton of damage. I think I worked out that sevens near the warlord are pretty much going to guarantee killing a knight unless there's a big swing in terms of saves and if they do play minus one damage then you're going to probably at least bracket the knight. Whereas if you did fives if they play minus one damage you maybe leave the knight in top bracket and then on the return he kills like four or five your sangry guard that's a terrible trade and that's why we don't recommend squads of five sangry guard. Also seen tons of death company with five Five man with three to five thunder hammers, and we're seeing bunches of people now running infernal pistols and power swords. These guys are really cheap now. If I had more infernal pistols and power swords, I'd probably run more. I'm going to check after I've made this video actually how many I have. Uh, but Death Company and Sangry Guard are your two go-to units that we're seeing all the time. 
Uh, Terminators had a brief explosion when AOC dropped because obviously they are very survivable and, and arguably they're more survivable than the Sangre Guard because two damage weapons are pretty inefficient against them because they have three wounds. But over the last little while we've definitely seen a drop in Terminators and more people focusing on the Sangre Guard. I think the mobility of the Sangre Guard and probably the reliableness of their weapons, you know, most of your Terminator weapons in close combat are minus one to hit. I mean, it can be offset with Fury of the First Stratagem for one CP, but it does seem that Sangre Guard have definitely become more picked than Terminators. We've also seen Centurions. Uh, big squads of five have exploded on the competitive scene, and these are the lists that have done really well. And we've seen them with Flamers, Hurricane Bolters, and we've also seen Meltas. Uh, we've usually seen them backed up with a Priest to obviously make them more durable. Chris is going to come on the channel next week and he ran five in the Super Major in America and he's going to tell us exactly why he thinks they're a good unit. I have my concerns over them, right? They only move five. I guess you could advance them and shoot your flamers. Um, they lack core, so they can't score Oath of Moment anymore. And generally, they're quite slow. Yes, when they charge in melee, they will kill everything. Because they get a stupid amount of... Th three Centurions will pretty much kill anything in melee. So if you have a score of five, you're killing everything. Because they're hitting at strength ten with plus one to wound. They're minus four, they're flat three damage. And I think, I think the squad of three got like 17 attacks or something. So the squad of uh, five must get like 25 attacks. They can also combo with Quake Bolts as well, which makes up from their lack of core. So Centurions are just... They're crazy good. Uh, in combat. It's just getting them into the combat. Unless you're going to reserve them, but I don't think Chris is... I think they're using them as a screen and we're going to talk over that next week. Um, assault squads dropped in points. We've also seen that they can be a mobile unit that can perform, perform actions pretty well because of the jump packs. I believe it's 108 points to take them on a score of 6, but 5 can obviously do a job as well for 90 points. I need to jump in with a quick edit and say that sometimes what the mission secondaries or the primary plus, as we like to call them, will see is if your unit's obsec, then it'll finish the action within your turn, otherwise it'll finish in your next command phase, meaning you remove potentially the chance of your opponent to kill that unit and prevent you doing the action by being daisy chained within six inches of your right of war character. My advice if you're building a Blood Angels list would be take four units of jump units and ideally two units of Sangre Guard. I think the heroic intervention strat is extremely valuable. Uh, you can position battles or models to basically get insane value um, from the heroic intervention. Sometimes you can catch your own opponents out, sometimes you can get a good amount of extra movement during their turn, which, I mean, technically you can get nine inches additional movement if you manage to heroic intervene six, kill something and move three. But uh, in my masterclass video, I made a point that I knew that he was gonna fly over my units with uh, I forget, the Harpy, I think, was the name of the turned unit. I was 100% sure he's going to fly over me because he wants to drop bombs on me. So I positioned my squad of Sangue Guard at the back of, like, a bubble of my guys. So if you flew over me and landed behind me, he would be within range of the Sangue Guard for a heroic intervention. So you can do stuff like that that maybe you normally wouldn't be able to do. And yes, maybe not everybody... Everybody maybe forgets the Sangue Guard can heroically intervene, but... I think I've won a lot of games or have turned battles just with smart position of the Sangre Guard. So this is why I still, well I'm running three at the moment, but I think two are so important. I think if you only have one, I went to a tournament before when I had one and I decided to make it a big squad of nine because I thought like, well a big squad will, will make up for me taking some losses, but it, it felt like there's too many eggs in one basket. So I think you need two squads of Sangre Guard, minimum six, ideally seven. Um, and then remember the Sanger Ancient, if you do take him, he can also heroically intervene and he's even more powerful if you'd put Rites of War on him. But let's talk about fire support. Like I said, the lists that were winning tournaments with Blood Angels six months ago before Nephilim had fire support. We haven't seen very many lists win tournaments post Nephilim. I don't think we've seen any win a tournament with no fire support. Fire support is a difficult topic to discuss as well. It came up in this week's Army List show and... Yeah, I think it's a difficult topic to discuss because I don't think there's like a real standout that like this is the best fire support. You need to take this in every game. Um, I've tried going the full melee list and I, I did that to a, the RTT that I came third in. 
and the reason that I didn't win the RTT was because I played Space Wolves in the final game and he had a bunch of fight on death units and basically for the fight on death units I had to trade and trade basically I had to trade down every time I wanted to kill his fight on death units right um, if you're playing Sisters of Battle and they've got Repentia then you know what I'm talking about um, so dropping all forms of fire support is very difficult and the second part of that would even be dropping the whirlwind uh, I rely heavily on counter offensive if in turn three I'm gonna make two charges against two really nasty targets I want to definitely fight with the one on the right for example and then on one on the left without him being able to interrupt then that's what my whirlwind will do it will counter offensive one squad so I can basically fight with two charges in a row sometimes that can be the difference between wiping two enemy units or them counter fencing and wiping you back right if you were you know you were charging a large squad and then a, a big avatar or something and it's like you need to fight first twice here so that's why i take the whirlwind in just about every game and i cannot cannot <laughs> drop him sometimes his prevention to overwatch is good as well but whirlwind is very important so over the last few months after pivoting to full melee i've started running the likes of those Vulcan Relic Contemptors. I ran a list that had a couple of Redemptors. I even ran a list that had Leviathan in it to try and just get a feel for like, is there still merit in the double Dreadnought melee unit list? And speaking about tournaments, that Space Wolf player that beat me at the final actually ran a double Redemptor Space Wolf. So it was like a Space Wolf melee list with Vanguard veterans and Wolven and all this sort of stuff. But he had double Redemptor, and because I had no pressure on the Redemptors, because I couldn't get to them, um, then it then it kind of hurt me. So I've tried running the double Redemptors, and, and, and that tournament game, the final table, if you watch my Masterclass, I didn't think there was enough terrain on the final table. So if you're low on terrain, and the opponent like outshoots you, then that can be a big problem. I think for most of the tournaments that you go to, going all melee, the terrain typically isn't a problem. Assuming that, you know, it's a pretty legit tournament with enough terrain, but you never really know, like a smaller RTT, exactly what you're going to get, right? So other fire support that we've seen other people doing is, uh, we've got we've seen Sam, who's done really well with Blood Angels as well. He's running the Eliminators with Laz Fusels. We've seen a few people do them. We've also seen Land Speeders with Multi Meltas. We've also tried and seen Eradicators in some of the winning lists. Junior that won a bunch of Blood Angels tournaments, or a bunch of tournaments last year with Blood Angels, was running multiple Eradicator squads. Haven't seen him win anything for a little while, but, and I tried Eradicators and I felt like they got a big bonus from Armor of Contempt. You put them in cover, they're on a two up save, you know, ignoring one AP, but then I played Tyranids and, yeah, I mean, they spit out so many mortal wounds and stuff. My Eradicators really didn't survive very well at all. Um, in the near future, I think I'm going to try and attack bikes as well, and I think I'm going to try also try running one of my super heavies. But like I said, all these options are probably viable. The tricky part is, if you start taking dreadnoughts, you eat into your elite slots. So, land speeders, eradicators, attack bikes, and eliminators are not going to eat up those elite slots. The one thing that we haven't said are Inceptors, and we've seen a few people still hang on to Inceptors. Some people still think they're good. I think they're overcosted. Um, I think 300 points for a unit of like five with plasmas that are kind of weak if you ever come up against a minus one damage enemy and also have a chance to kill themselves. I don't like them, but again, you could put them into this list. I don't know if there's a singular best choice here, but if you're building a list, you could consider any of these options as good fire support. All right, let's 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 move on. Finally, for today, I want to talk about iteration and what works for you. So I haven't touched on characters, but I've got loads of videos on this channel about characters and stuff like that. And if there is a video or a unit or something that you want to see a more in-depth dive in and me discuss it for your entertainment, please leave me a comment. I will reply to every comment on this channel. So, um... Yeah, leave it to me and, and I'll discuss it with you. But the last part of today's video is I want to talk about iteration and using what works for you. And I think one of the key examples of this is the emergence of Centurion squads. Um, and then maybe to a lesser extent, my use of Terminator slash Mephisto slash Super Heavies, right? If you are using an army and you're using it a lot and you feel comfortable with it, then I think you can take it to a tournament and you can probably do reasonably well. I wouldn't have said that I expected a Space Wolf 
list with double redemptor to win an event, but it did. I also wouldn't have expected a Blood Angels list with five Centurions to emerge as like the next hot thing and have multiple top players play it and perform really well. Just, just missing out on a tournament win, I believe Stephen Box did by like I think it was like a single misplay or a single wrong stratagem or something and he would have potentially won an event with five centurions right so I think this just goes to show if there's something that you're really passionate about and you want to use it then use it you know uh, it doesn't matter that it isn't super meta as long as the stats aren't like horrible like I wouldn't go ahead and say like run three ball predators but maybe if you play with about three ball predators every week for a year then you could actually feel like, yes, you know what, I can go to an event with three ball predators because I know exactly how much damage they do, I know exactly how to use them, I know exactly how to do pressure. And before my last tournament, the one that I came third in, I really wanted to run the Rites of War Visage of Death combo on the Sanguary Priest. That's what I wanted to take. But because I got COVID, I literally got one practice game. I felt like at that point... Going to a tournament with a list that I've played one time against going to a tournament I'd played Mephiston with Terminators for like six months because obviously Mephiston got a Primar uh, Primaris model and I wanted to use it and I was enjoying, I was painting my Terminators people. If you remember the stream where I was painting Terminators every week on the channel for six months, I was painting the Terminators and I had Mephiston and I wanted to use them and I feel like I did really well. If I hadn't, if I hadn't, traded so badly into the fight last stuff of the Space Wolves, I could have potentially won that event. So, and I guess Steven showed that you could maybe win an event taking five Centurions. So my point is you don't have to pick something super meta. You just have to play the same lists and iterate on what you know. And obviously the more opponents you can play those lists into, the better. So as you work through your choices for your armor list, really know that there's no right or wrong answer. It can also heavily depend on your play style and choices. And I think there's multiple ways to play Blood Angels. Obviously we can go like full on, relentless assault, always be charging, units in their deployment zone in turn one, or we can sit for a couple of turns, uh, wait until the Assault Doctrine kicks in, you know, hedge our bets, and then put multiple charges across the board at that point. Um, my recommendation is that if you are Using this sort of template to build your list, then build a solid core and iterate between games, switching out just one or two models, or one or two units rather, that you feel aren't performing. The worst thing I think you can do is just throw a whole list in the bin and start over, right? You need to have like 80% of the list set. These are the things that you like. You're going to use them week in, week out. Some weeks, yes, every model will have a bad week. You know, I had a, I had a game on the channel a few weeks ago against Eldar, where all my Sangre Guard units did terrible. I mean, that's going to happen, but that's why iterate on small changes week on week. And then finally, if you are going to a tournament, set up your list about a month before, know all the ins and outs, and I think knowing your list is sometimes more important than jumping on the current meta. Maybe at the super large events, you might need to jump on the current meta. But if you're just going to like RTTs or 30 player GTs, I think play what you know. And that's what I'm going to be trying this year. I think I'm going to continue to run Mephiston. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'm looking forward. I've got an event in a couple of weeks and then I've got one in November and then maybe a team event next year. So I've got a few tournaments finally coming up. Looking forward to it. I'm going to be iterating on this stuff. And like I said, trying to find what heavy support or fire support works for me because I feel like I like fire support and I don't want to lose out to another fight on death army slash enemy. That's a real counter for Blood Angels. If you know how to counter that effectively, then please let me know in the comment. But the way I see it is there is no real counter. You're going to trade badly into those units even if you could fall on Fury into them with Death Company and kill them in turn one, you know they're probably instantly going to pay the CP, fight back and kill a bunch of your stuff. So the final thing to say today is that we do Armulus reviews on this channel every Sunday night at 9.45 GMT time. Maybe we've missed a couple of weeks this summer, but uh, 
I've been away, things should be back to normal now. So you are more than welcome to leave me a list in a video, like in any of my YouTube videos, export your list from Battlescribe, put it in the comments. I'll add it to the queue. We usually do about five or six lists every week. We're usually live for about an hour and a half. And I will suggest how you can maybe improve your list. And also our community, there's always like 50 people hanging out every Sunday night. They'll they'll let you know in the chat as well if I miss something or if they have a better suggestion. You'll get that in the chat. So I would love it if you would consider doing that and also just join any of our live streams. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you have any comments or anything to add, please leave me it down below. And if you would consider hitting that like button, that would be super appreciated. Or the subscribe if you've not seen my channel before. I do do Blood Angels videos every week. And if you want to support me, there's a big join button underneath the channel as well. I really hope I will catch you guys in the next video. Hopefully this video helps you if you're having any thoughts about army lists. Until next time, brothers. By the blood are we made strong.